Apple's working on a new pro-level iMac. To create a product that will take Mac further than it's ever gone before. That's bigger, more powerful, and maybe even more expensive. It is the most powerful Mac we have ever created. Like the M1 iMac having a love baby with the Pro Display XDR. Yes! I'm Renee Ritchie. Thanks to Curiosity Stream and Nebula for sponsoring. Hit that subscribe button so we can hit 300K. And yeah, we gotta talk about this. So according to recent reports, Apple is getting ready to finally, finally ditch the old 27 inch Intel iMac and replace it with something slimmer, sleeker, and just a hell of a lot more powerful. A next generation M1 iMac Pro, an iMac Max Pro, maybe as soon as March or June of 2022. Now, why didn't an M1 Pro or M1 Max iMac launch alongside the new MacBook Pro back in October? Well, because Apple's Mac team only has so much bandwidth, that's how Apple keeps their focus. And they were focused on getting that 24 inch M1 iMac out last spring and those new MacBook Pros out last fall. And given everything else that went on during 2021, that meant pushing the Pro iMacs to next spring at the earliest. But like the 24 inch M1 iMac, it means Apple can now update the design to something that simply wasn't possible with the older, hotter, more power hungry Intel Core and Xeon processors. Something without so much bump in the trunk, so much baby's got iMac, something much more flat. That's because while Intel's latest Alder Lake CPUs gulp down upwards of 100 watts, 200 in some cases, 300 if overclocked, Apple's M1 Pro and M1 Max sip only 30 watts under full load. The Max will only hit 100 watts if you push all 32 GPU cores to the Max. And yet, that doesn't just matter for laptops and battery life, it matters for all machines because thermal envelopes and chassis apply to all machines. We've seen people have to go with water cooling just to keep Alder Lake from halting and catching fire in a mini tower. Now, can you imagine what that would look like in an iMac? Well, Apple could, which is exactly why they made the switch to custom silicon. With efficiency driving the performance, instead of just raw brutish voltage, they don't have to worry about the thermal envelope, the cooling systems anywhere nearly as much, so they can push the design more and give us an iMac that doesn't look like a display with the computer strapped to the back, but an iMac that just looks like the display, and that's it. Now, I'll get back to that display and that design in a minute because it sounds like some of the reports have shifted there a bit. But first, the M1 Pro and M1 Max, and I should have my deep dive on those chipsets up soon. So seriously, hit that subscribe button. But just like the M1 iMac uses the exact same chipset as the M1 MacBook Air, the M1 Pro and Max iMac sound like they'll be using the exact same M1 Pro and Max chipsets as the MacBook Pro. And that means dual ice storm efficiency cores and six to eight firestorm performance cores. Same with 12 or 16 and 24 or 32 G13 graphics cores, 16 neural engine cores, single or dual media engines, and up to 64 gigabytes of unified memory. So why still M1 and not M2? If similar reports are saying the MacBook Air will be arriving with M2. Well, maybe they will be M2 Pro and Max, but the big story with M2 generation CPU cores, if they're based on A15, the way that M1 is based on A14, is that they'll run just way more efficiently, which is super important for an ultra low power device like the MacBook Air, but nowhere nearly as important for an ultra high performance device like the iMac Pro. The M2 generation GPU cores, well, those have quite the performance boost, so it'd be great to see them in a Mac at least eventually, but my guess is, Apple is going to want to leverage economies of scale here by using the exact same M1 Pro and Max chips just to keep costs down. And Apple's never really cared about the chronology when it comes to more powerful chips anyway. The A12Z iPad Pro was released like six months after the A13 iPhone after all, and Apple had zero cores left to give. They were just fresh out about it. So at the very least, we should see performance similar to the 16 inch MacBook Pro, maybe slightly better if the thermal envelope and cooling systems allow it like 16 inch MacBook Pro on permanent high power mode performance. Now, there have also been rumors of a dual M1 Max model for the iMac Pro, which is just exactly what it sounds like. Four efficiency cores, 16 performance cores, 64 graphics cores, 32 neural engine cores, and quad media engines, along with up to 128 gigabytes of unified memory, or however that actually works out in a dual die implementation. And that should just tear through Pro workflows, like, Hawkeye through tracksuit Dracula's bro tear through. Especially since once you start to render, the media engines take over, leaving the CPUs and GPUs available to do other things. It's like, 
It's like getting a second Mac for free while your first Mac is off doing all that rendering. And it's one of the absolutely single most important benefits over the old CPU bound Intel boxes of yore. Now I've done whole entire videos on multi-die M1 Macs and the next Mac Pro and M2 in the next MacBook Air. And I'll link both of those in the description right below the like button. But back to the design and the display, which is good news, bad news, depending on how you look at it. Reports are almost universal now that the iMac Pro will look a lot like the new 24 inch M1 iMac and the Pro Display XDR. The former because it'll have that new flat design. And yeah, including a stand at no extra charge. The latter because instead of off white bezels and a taste the rainbow of colors, it'll have a far more properly pro aesthetic of black bezels and silver, maybe, maybe space gray colors. Now, reports on the size have been far less than universal. Older reports said it would clock in at 32 inches, the same size as a Pro Display XDR. New reports are saying 27 inches, same as the current Intel iMac. Now, I'm personally hoping for 32 inches because let's give the people more. I'm only expecting 27 inches though, because I'd much rather be surprised by all this than disappointed. Speaking of which, the panel could be 5K or 6K mini LED and ProMotion like the MacBook Pro, which means near OLED levels of HDR or high dynamic range and up to 120 Hertz refresh rate. We've never seen ProMotion permanently plugged into a wall though. So whether it drops all the way down to 24 Hertz to save power, like for environmental reasons rather than just battery life reasons, we'll have to wait and see. And yes, literally every single person on this planet, if not many others, will wanna use the new iMac in target display mode for the MacBooks, but my guess is it won't work because of how Apple's custom TCON has historically synced dual streams for 5K. So here's once again, just hoping they either figure out how to fix that, or we get a standalone cinema display variant like we used to get with the old Thunderbolt and LED displays because LG just can't ID, you see. Then yeah, regular and nano textured matte options, please and thank you. That just leaves the two biggest questions in terms of the display. Will it have a notch like the MacBook Pro? So Apple can just, you know it, Thanos snap as much of that pop bezel off as is inhumanly possible. And either way, will it have face ID? So Apple can finally bring their biometric facial geometry scanner to the Mac. Now the ports will reportedly include MagSafe and multiple Thunderbolt 4 like the M1 iMac, as well as SDXC and HDMI like the MacBook Pro with HDMI being a first for the iMac. Also ethernet on the power brick, also like the M1 iMac, which should let it drive just as many pro displays and TVs as the MacBook Pro, maybe even double if the dual die model really does just dual die all the things. Because the really cool thing is, Apple's already told us exactly how they're scaling up for pros. They just said it out loud during my talk with the VP of Custom Silicon and the VP of Mac Product Marketing. And you can listen to the extended version of that interview, ad-free and sponsor-free on Nebula. The scalability getting from where we were in M1 even, to where we are in M1 Pro and M1 Max was a fundamental re-architecture of what we call the fabric, the interconnect through which all of these different cores connect together. And the big challenge- That's where I post all of my videos, including extended versions of my interviews, reviews, and explainers, and my exclusive documentary on the original iPhone, all on Nebula, where I have the luxury of making videos that don't have to be optimized for YouTube, but where I know, I just know, the absolute nerdiest, most hardcore of you will totally love them. Plus Nebula just added a Roku app as well as Apple TV and picture in picture on iOS. And right now bundled in for free when you sign up with today's sponsor at curiositystream.com slash Renee Ritchie or click the link below. Cause you're watching this video, you can get CuriosityStream on Black Friday sale for 42% off, less than 12 bucks a year, less than the price of a USB-C dongle for the whole entire year. And that includes their thousands of amazing documentaries and series like the Demolition Man, where Brendan Moore dives into the process of what it takes to bring down some of the biggest structures from around the world. It's the absolute best way to support educational creators directly, and frankly, the best damn deal in streaming today. For over 42% off CuriosityStream, less than 12 bucks a year, and Nebula bundled in for free. Just click the button on the screen or go to curiositystream.com slash Renee Ritchie. Clicking on that button really helps out the channel, and so does hitting the playlist above for more, much more on M1, M1 Pro, M1 Max, and all the Macs that are coming next. Just hit up that playlist and I'll see you in the next video.